Welcome. Hi guys, thanks for joining us. Hi, uh, Neela from Australia. Felicity, I was wondering, there's a scene in the film where Cassian just has to stand back and watch Jin kick Stormtrooper butt, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> I wonder how you feel seeing yourself do that and if the process of finding Jin for you was about maybe finding your inner warrior that you didn't know you had. Yeah, well, it's in Jin's head, it's very clear she hates the Empire. So, um, so any time she seems, sees stormtroopers, she has this kind of um, yeah, very clear instinct to take them down. So, uh, so I just tapped into that, into that energy that Jin has. And it was, I'd never done that kind of thing before. Um, it was very new, the whole kind of physical preparation, that side, um, side of acting. I'm kind of used to lots of, you know, talking in corsets, so it was really nice to be running around with, um, with a, a blaster and, and a, a baton to uh, bash stormtroopers with. But it was, yeah, it was an extraordinary process and you work very closely with the <coughs> stunt team who take you through every kind of move and moment and, um, and, and, and support you throughout the whole thing and, and I was very lucky to have a, have a great support from the, from the stunt team doing it. Um, what format was Rogue One shot on and why have you guys chosen the specific formats that you're shooting uh, for the new Star Wars movies? Um, well, when you, I mean, we had the difficult task of, we were kind of making a period piece as well. We're making a film that sort of, we'd say to the crew and the designers, like, imagine this is set in 1977 and don't do anything we couldn't have done back then in terms of aesthetic. And that applied to the camera work in, to some extent in that, um, but obviously in today's cinema, you know, we've got these 4K projections and things going on in IMAX and, and this brand new camera had come out from Arri and um, it was incredible. And it's like four times the resolution of normal uh, film cameras. Um, but Greg, the DOP was like, okay, this is fantastic, but we also want to go back to the 70s with the analog kind of look of the movie. And so he got hold of this Panavision lens that's from uh, 70 millimeter anamorphic. They shot Ben-Hur with this actual lens. And for the first time ever in cinema, uh, Ari who, and Panavision, which are two separate companies in the film industry, they came together to make one camera for Star Wars. And it was incredible. And the, for those who are technically minded, what the result is, you get this very narrow depth of field. So if you're focused on me, the background's quite blurred and the foreground's quite blurred. And it was a nightmare for the focus puller. Um, there was this young guy called Jake and he performed a miracle because we were like, there was battle scenes. We didn't put marks down. We were just running in there with the camera and he was always getting the focus. We didn't drop any shot out of the movie because it was, because it was out of focus. And, and I think a lot of the beauty in the film is down to the, the cameras that we used. So it had that look of, like it's like a modern version of the past, you know, it was kind of what we're going for, which is kind of what Rogue One is trying to achieve. Yeah, and I would just say that I think what's really great about the fact that we're now moving into these standalone movies is that we're bringing in um, essentially auteur directors like Gareth and we're really supporting those uh, directors and their vision and we're looking at each of these movies without a rule book. We're basically saying, okay, here's a new story, a new movie, a new approach. What do we want to do? And we're very open to that. And um, I think it very much is in the spirit of what uh, George Lucas did to begin with. I mean, he inspired ILM innovation and technological innovation was extremely important to him. And it's very much a part of the culture of this company. So that's what we, we want to continue. Hey, so yeah, I mean, it was all subconscious to some extent. We've watched Star Wars to death. Like, uh, you guys, I think, have seen the opening of the film, most of you, if not all of you. And um, it's kind of a reflection of Star Wars and New Hope to some extent. And this is really a segue so I can get these guys in because in, we went to Iceland to film the opening scene. And uh, it didn't occur to me till, till, till later that when you think about New Hope, you know, the very first time you see the antagonist come in, Darth Vader, it's a black guy in a black cape, surrounded by white stormtroopers. And at the opening of our film, there's, there's a guy in a white cape, surrounded by black stormtroopers. 
And it's all these subconscious things where we're trying to take what's familiar, but sort of invert it or twist it. And filming that scene uh, with Ben and Mads, I, 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 it, was, it was one of the hardest things we've ever filmed. And people say, what's the hardest scene you ever did? I think it was probably that one, because we were freezing our tits off out there. <laughs> it was, it was, and, and the worst thing was, is fog was coming in, and then it'd suddenly disappear. So we'd set up these amazing shots, and we'd be really excited. And then suddenly, there'd be a whiteout, and you couldn't see like three meters ahead of you. You'd have to wait, and then suddenly it would clear. And, and these are like two of the most incredible actors in the world. And it was just so good to just sit, put them up against each other and go and let it, let it unfold. And ben, ben is so relaxed in front of the camera that he would start like, just messing around. Like, he's very playful. And I thought he was reciting Shakespeare or something like to get himself into character. <laughs> and then I would listen carefully to the lyrics and realize he was singing Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. And, <laughs> And even like Frozen, I think there was like times where. Oh yeah, I did sing a bit of Frozen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was it? We we used to be friends or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that. We used to be friends. So I can't. Oh, it's escaping me now. But yes, I remember it vividly. Yeah. <laughs> Very intimidating, I'm sure. Uh, Michael Adato from the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia. A question for Gareth and also for Ben. The, the big cameo here, obviously, or the big kind of guest appearance, is Darth Vader. Can you talk a little bit about working with that costume, how powerful that image is in cinema? And when you are actually actors on a working film set, what happens in the tipping point between dealing with an actor in a costume and the fact that that actor in that costume is, is a very powerful per personal cinematic image that is present in front of you? Want to go? <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, the first, the first thing you, you, you have to do is just get over the fact that you're doing a scene with, um, Darth Vader. And that, that takes, um, yeah, that, that took me a little while, um, because I am, uh, you know, I'm a first generation fanboy. Um, so... <laughs> I was, um, yeah, it, it, it took a little while to feel like, um, uh, like I could answer him with some solidity, like we could have a, um, a discussion, as it were. Um, that, that took a little while. And also, um, Darth, is, his, his gestures and his mannerisms are so familiar that... Um, finding uh, someone that can uh, can execute that in a way that is fluid um, is its own skill set, and um, so that that requires a certain amount of um, of thought and consideration too when you're doing it. But you know, there, there was a time, uh, <laughs> Ben. I you know he's you, you all know Ben's work. He's he's. He's got this ability to be, if he wants to, to be incredibly intimidating. And, um, and in, t in the entire process of making the film, it was a kid in a candy store. We had an amazing time. And I kept thinking, I wonder if there'll ever be this moment where I'll see like, some of the characters he's played or something pop out. And there was, we were in the middle of filming the scene with, with Darth, and Ben was like, Gareth, I need to talk to you. And I was like, what's the matter? And he goes, I need to go in the corner and talk to you. I need to have a word. And it was like, oh, shit, here we go, what's the matter? And we go over and I'm like, are you right, Ben? He's like, nah. And it's like, what's the matter? And he goes, it's Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I know. <laughs> and we both had this little moment where we melted and we could just admit it. And then we turned around really professionally like, OK, we'll try and fix that. And we walked back. <laughs> uh, I would geek out too. I mean, it's probably still pretty difficult to, to pull a scene with Darth Vader and like not turn into a child again. And, and, and you can tell when he's coming on set because we, we learn a little bit that we should do the rehearsals and talk through the scene without the costume. Yeah. Because as soon as that helmet goes on, it's too intimidating. You can't give direction to Darth Vader. Like, <laughs> you know, he tells you what he's going to do. And so, so, but then what happens is, you know, his film sets are really noisy. There's a lot of, you know, banging and clattering going on. And suddenly it just starts to get quiet and you're chatting to someone and why has it gone so quiet? And in comes Darth Vader and he stands on, and the whole crew is just like a five-year-old going <laughs> like this. And we all, it ha happens to everybody, and then you think, oh, I've got to go over and speak to him. And you have to snap out of it. It's, um, it's, 
It is, it's probably one of the highlights of getting to do this film was little moments of that, and you're very aware of it. Everyone there is very aware of it, and you become the most popular person in the world the day you're filming those scenes because they, you look around and there's... Everyone turns up. Yeah. <laughs> that, um, Mads, your character Galen is, is kind of a complicated character because he's not, I mean, he does, dare, he does, you know, he's involved with bad things. <clears throat> he's not necessarily a villain. What kind, of, what kind of approach do you have to like a character with that sort of complexity? No, but he's, yeah, he's, uh, I mean, I think that as actors, we always try to find like uh, the two sides of a character. But definitely it's in this one because uh, he's working together with this gentleman in something that he believes from the very beginning has uh, a project that has the ability to change the world into a better place. And though be it that it, uh, it turns out that he's working on something that he didn't know. Uh, and, and for that reason, he's in a gigantic dilemma. And for the reasons I will not spoil here, the dilemma gets even bigger. Uh, so yes, that's a gray zone here. Mm -hmm. As you said, it used to be maybe in the 70s, in the 80s, a little more black and white, but there are a lot of grays in here. Question? Behind you again. Oh, okay. David Fern okay. from Endor Express. I will ask the cast earlier about the, their thoughts on their first action figures. I know Mads doesn't have one yet, but hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I wanted to hear the cast on their thoughts of getting finally there themselves in plastic form, and if Gareth could talk about the score by Michael Giacchino at all. Okay. That. We'll start with the action figures, because that's always fun. Whereas you got one, right? <laughs> this um, has a few. I did get an action figure. I was very pleased, because I think he's a lot better looking than I am. I think they <laughs> accidentally modeled it on Diego or something. <laughs> he's e easily confused. Um, uh, yeah, it was a kind of surreal, amazing um, moment. To be honest, I remember kind of playing with those toys as a kid, and so to be part of that universe, you know, in in plastic is uh, is an amazing thing. Christmas shopping is easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> slightly narcissistic, but yeah, giving everyone little versions. They're like, why are you giving Christmas? Me... <laughs> why are you giving me Diego? I thought you wanted to give yours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Michael uh, uh, did an amazing score for us. He's um, he's a massive, 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 massive Star Wars fan. I think a lot of us compete for who's the biggest Star Wars fan working on the film. And I go around his house and you walk in the door and, and in his main front room is, I don't know how big, but it feels like it's that big, but it's like 13 foot tall framed poster of A New Hope. And sort of joke like, oh, you didn't have to do that for us. And he's like, no, this has been up for like 13 years. Um, <laughs> And he said he listened to Empire Strikes Back soundtrack to death as a kid. And it's just, I think the vocabulary of that music is in him and, and it just poured out. And there's stuff, I mean, you know, there, there's particular moments in the film musically, um, especially towards the end that is truly stunning and, and, and very emotional. And I think he just knocked it out of the park. We were very lucky.